Hey, in your bulletins this morning, you all saw this. Um, this is our message today. And I wanted you to have that in your hand uh, to be a blessing to you. Uh, it looks just like the one that I have, except mine has a few more things on it. And Tim told me this morning when he saw this, he said, well, that's interesting because I've never heard you get through an entire sermon yet, so what are you going to do about this? But at least you'll get through it because you have it written in front of you, you see. So I hope that's a blessing to you. But we're going to, uh, along with the Thanksgiving theme, we're going to talk about being thankful today. Eight things the word faithful tells us. Now, there could be a lot of other words that put in here, and somebody help me with this. I called this an anagram, but I don't think that's what this is. What, what are, what's the name of this thing when you make a word out of a letter? Acronym. What is it? Acronym. Acronym? Would that be right? Acronym. Well, I, yeah, whatever it is, that's what we have, right? <laughs> <laughs> that shows a lot of education. That's okay, folks. Um, we're going to read, we have some scriptures, and please know that there's other words that we could have put in here, like uh, for the letter F, I put faithful. We could have put family. You know, that's the beauty of this. You can take this as a model and find all kinds of things to be thankful for and just extrapolate it, write it out there, uh, and be very sincere about it. And I want to encourage you. Um, this week, if you have time between all the craziness, we saw a little bit of it yesterday shopping, uh, but when you find some time to settle and think about what we really should be doing this week to be thankful, to have gratitude and appreciation, um, write it down somewhere. Some people may, you may keep a, a ledger or a, a diary of some sort. Um, as I started doing this, uh, I started on a little document on my computer, and I saved it because it was very helpful to me as I prayed and said, Lord, just tell me how to, what each letter I want to put here. I know this is what I want to do, and it just came. And the first one I got is what I went on, but there's so many more that you can do. It's just a good model to go from. Uh, nothing tried, it's very important, but it gives us a tool to work with. So I wanted to put that in your hands today so you can follow right along, and we'll see if I can get through all of them, Okay. Um, and I may even ask some, a few of you to read a scripture here and there. Not totally sure about that because I might forget, but we'll, just, we'll see where we can go with that. Uh, but these eight things that we talk, first of all, why is it important to be thankful? Well, it's important for two reasons, because there's at least two entities involved, probably more. But I am of the opinion that the biggest benefit of being thankful is being the thankful Er instead of the thankful E. <laughs> because whenever you really express that to someone, someone does a nice thing for you, uh, gives you something, uh, helps you with something, and you get, there's a, there is a physical feeling with that. Now, we don't do those things for physical feelings. Love is the same way in a way, actually on about an equal level if you, if you understand what the word is telling us. But it's a beautiful thing to be thankful when it comes from the heart because it's a sincere communication between people. And when you really have gratitude and express that in whatever way possible, whether it be private or publicly, whether it be monetary or just shaking hands and hugging somebody, uh, that is what I see as a building block in the foundation of our life that we should be thankful for. And you know how easy it is not to be thankful. And what would you say, if, if, if a word comes to your mind, just share this with me. What, what do you think the opposite of thankful is? Say it louder. Indifferent. Indifferent. Anyone else? Okay. Not being, it's, when you're thankful, you're paying attention to it. And to be not thankful, you can just ignore things altogether. You know, you're, you're thinking that there's, um, you're thinking that there's uh, options that uh, I'm going to do on purpose to show people that I'm not thankful. And there are people that do that. People, it's bitterness comes into play, uh, revenge. <laughs> Somebody might do something wrong. You know, the Word tells us to give thanks in all things. 
that's kind of a tough one. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I'm the epitome of, of perfection for everything I'm sharing with you because we all, we're all human beings. And even people who are, who are um, elite, people who are uh, charismatic, who are on television, they're all just people. They, they live, they make mistakes, they have successes, the whole thing. So we can, we can be at a place in our life whenever uh, we want to be thankful and sincere that puts everybody on the same level. And it benefits the person you're handing the appreciation to because it's, it's one of the hooks of the gospel. It's one of the wonderful things that lets people know that you're sincere and you're paying attention. And when you don't pay attention, you just go on your way and don't do anything about it. That weakens relationships. And then on the other end, when you go the far and you, 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 someone does something, maybe people, I've done it myself, people do something they intended to be good for you, but you might be in a wrong state of mind or somebody kicked your cat or something and you don't see it that way. Um, maybe you think it's a bad thing. I saw a picture like this the other day. Uh, it's a picture and it showed this dog in the corner down here. He was a sheep dog. And it showed he had his, his mouth around the neck of a sheep. And you, you see the head and, the, and the, the sheep and the neck, and you see all these sheep in the background, and, and it said, never judge anything out of context. And when they pulled back, the sheep was going to fall over into the waters if the dog was saving him. But you see, that good thing could be misinterpreted. Sometimes we do good things for people, and our intention is good, and maybe they receive it wrong. They just, maybe it's still a good thing for them. We, I grew up with this in the South all the time. Uh, people want to give things to you. We don't receive charity here. We don't, you know, we don't, uh, we, we're, it's pride is what it is. Uh, and when people need it and you're, you're pushing back like that, uh, it, it erodes the foundation and it makes it that much more difficult, not for you trying to express your thanks, but for the other person. But you know what? We still need to be thankful even if it's not appreciated, even if it's something that's misinterpreted coming back, just keep doing it. Just keep praying, God, forever give me the heart to be thankful. And the Holy Spirit, he's given us that one of our uh, subjects here is, talks about that specifically. So let's go, to our, let's go to our list, the first one, thankful. And the first one I have is the word time, Ephesians 5, 15, 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are our days evil? Today, is this, this place is messed up today, right? But it's been messed up for a long time. We just have the internet to amplify it instantly now. <laughs> and people do what people do. And, and it can be a good thing. But it is evil times. And to redeem the time, it's quite a challenge for us. Yeah, I looked up the word circumspectly. I got a little note thing beside here that says, what does circumspectly mean? Unwilling to take risks, to walk circumspectly. That's a King James word and some other translations that means don't risk not living good. Don't risk not trying to be what Christ wants us to be. And... In other words, there's going to be temptations, there's going to be opportunities for us to do our own thing, our own way, but we need to be, the word circumspectly has a lot of good meanings to it as well. Uh, we need to pay attention to the fact that the time is very important. We need to be thankful that we have the time because time doesn't stop for anybody. It keeps going and going. I know that's true because I look in the mirror every day. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes you look in there and you have to reintroduce yourself because I don't know who that dude is. But it's important to be thankful for the time we have, and then it's important to redeem that time, to make sure it's spent wisely, to make sure that what we feed our minds on and the things we participate in, that, that we spend that time well. Because I think in eternity, only then we'll realize how precious and how finite it is. Here, you know, we live our days and... 20, I remember when I was 30 years old, I thought, man, I'm getting old. <laughs> what I'd give to go back to the, at least in the body, not on the inside. But the, that's why time is so very important. That's why it's so very precious when we interact with people. Those are times, and I can guarantee you this, if there's a challenge in that time frame, 
when you're interacting with someone, perhaps someone at work, someone that you like, someone that doesn't like you, when you're interacting with them, that time might be the only time you get to spend with them. It might be the only time they get to hear and see that Christ is in us. That's why we have to be circumcised. Don't risk not doing it, not walking that way. Now, we can't walk that way all on our own, and being a Christian isn't something we make our mind up that I'm just going to do and do and do and do, uh, because we're subject to fail. We're subject to temptations, and we don't have to sin, but if we do, the Bible says we have an advocate, the Father that helps us, but we're living in that cesspool of sin, and it tries to rob that time from us. And so many times, we have to look back and say, boy, I missed that opportunity. I didn't spend that time wisely. I wish I had done this. I wish I had made that choice about my time. But we don't get that second chance. But we do have the second chance if we're born again because now we know that if we spend, that make the decision that we're going to not take risk with our time, but we're going to do what God wants us to do with it is important. The word circumspect comes from a root word among many words, uh, circumference, circling all around, front, back, and of course, as a believer, it's not just in front or behind, but it's above, below, and from the inside. We need to pay attention to all those things where our time is concerned. Um, I don't play video games. I don't even judge people that do. I don't, it's not my job to judge anyone. Um, there is benefit in the things that I don't have the slightest idea about. But I can tell you this, whether it be true with a, a, a game, whether it's true with golf, <laughs> whether recreation, whether it's true with um, spending time doing things that might be beneficial to us in the short term. We spend time doing that. Maybe that's not the wisest use of our time. At least let's make a belief and be thankful we have time that we can, and the ability to choose things in moderation and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to know how to spend, best spend our time. All right, the next letter is H. I chose the word hope. Uh, did any other words pop in your mind, when, by the way, when we go through this? Like, I've chose the word time at the beginning. What would be another word that somebody else might have thought of if you were going to do this? Think, thinking, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I chose time and I chose hope here. Romans fifteen thirteen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy. How much joy? All. How much is all? It's everything. May he fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So he wants you to fill you with all joy, and you could rightly say all peace in your faith, in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say by the willpower of Kurt, or by the wishes of my in-laws, or my brothers, or my children, or my neighbor, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have abound in hope. Not just get a little bit of hope, but an abundance of hope. And so having joy and peace in our faith unleashes Holy Spirit-driven hope. Now, the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of the things we hope for. And the substance just means what something is made out of. And so when you have your hope, you want your hope to be placed well. Now, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart, but David certainly had a lot of failures in his life. And when I say failures, that's being kind. I mean, he was a scheming murderer, an adulterer. He did lots and lots of wicked things, but a man after God's own heart. You can be after God's heart in this wicked world, and because of Jesus, it can change. That past can be erased, already having been paid for by Christ. So that gives us a hope beyond anything else we can hope for, better than anything else we can hope for. And the substance, our faith, tells us that it's true. So when you say, well, I hope I go to heaven, well, don't just throw it out there like the world's definition of hope. Let it be Holy Spirit driven. And by that, I mean there's two parts to that. The Holy Spirit is in our heart if we're a Christian, and the Word is in our heart. And the Word of God, the Bible, is what I call two different things. The dictionary of God's vocabulary. It's the words he uses. And the Holy Spirit speaks those words. And he doesn't use any other words. And if you want to hear him clearly and get his direction and have hope build up in you, you got to read the book and hide it in where? In your heart. Inside of you. Your spirit. 
Lock it in there. And then the Holy Spirit's in there. When you put the, the Word in there and as you rely on the Holy Spirit, then you can hear instruction and encouragement from Him because you're, you're allowing your spirit to have the words, the database, that when God speaks through the Holy Spirit, those words make sense. They make way more sense than we even realize. In fact, some of those words, we can read a chapter and a verse, and it means this. And then next week it can, oh, it also means this. Oh, and that too. And then 25 years later, we realize that it's an infinite meaning. God's word is alive and powerful. And it can, it can change every single human being if they'll just turn to him and change them in a good way. That's hope if I've ever heard of hope. In fact, in my words, I would say that's a guarantee. <laughs> but the world looks at hope in a different way. They, they look at hope almost like rolling the dice. Well, I, sure hope, I sure hope I don't get sick. <laughs> well, I sure hope I don't uh, wreck the car. I, don't, I hope I don't lose the dog. I hope the prices don't keep going up. Uh, we just throw hope out there with the right, negative right out of our mouth because when you say things like that and you hear things, you know good and well that there's no positive other side of that. You're just wishing for something miraculous to happen. But we have our hope is more steadfast, more guaranteed, permanent, eternal, unfailing. There you go. See, everything is built layer on layer on top because it's driven by the Holy Spirit. So hide the words in here. Pray and let the Spirit speak to you, and he'll use that vocabulary to build God-given hope inside of you. And that hope will bubble over. You can't hold it in. People will know it's in you. They'll be drawn to you and ask you, what is that? Well, here, let me tell you what this is. And that's where it goes from there, okay? All right, the, word, the letter A, available and approachable. I really love this one. This, this is, could be a whole lesson uh, Bible study for you or a sermon, whatever. Available and approachable. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace so we may, number one, obtain mercy, and number two, find grace to help in the time of our need. So it said, let us therefore come boldly. Now, when you see the word therefore, there's a reason that it's therefore. <laughs> and if you read prior to that, you'll see how God said a lot of encouraging things, how he's told us in so many ways that once we're his, he's ours, we're his, he's in us. The price has been paid for our sin. We're not guilty of those anymore. Christ died and the punishment for sin is death and he paid that for us. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. I've, you've heard me say this before maybe, but when we raised our kids... I told him on purpose, I said, now, when, when you go out and if you get into any kind of a, a pickle, any kind of trouble, even if it's serious, I don't want you to think, man, my dad's going to kill me. <laughs> How many of you have said that in your own mind, in your situation? And, and I know it's just a saying, and people say, well, you know what I mean. But folks, words are important. Some words are very, very important. And I told him, I said, I, I, I don't want you to ever even think that. Don't even say it in jest that my dad's going to kill me. Oh, I might, I might have a heavy hand of discipline for you, but it'll always be that I love you. And if you get in trouble, don't run away from me. Run to me. Come to me. But what's the first thing that happens whenever we fall short? What's the first thing that, first inclination in our body is to, oh man, what a mess this is. Maybe, and especially if you've done it, you've made an offense against someone, you avoid them. But the Father doesn't want us to avoid him. In fact, he didn't say, just come on in, crawl up the middle here, and come right on up to the throne, you miserable little pilgrim. <laughs> no, he said, come boldly to the throne. And Ron and I was talking the other day about praying and praying. Please understand, this, again, this is not a judgment, and not, probably just an observation more than anything, but wouldn't it be interesting if we talked to people the way we pray and talk to God? You know, like, here's how some people do it. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today, Lord, to ask you just to be here in your spirit, that you would just bless everyone, and you would just, Lord, just make everyone 
uh, so blessed and, and healthy today, and we thank you in Jesus' name. They come, come up to somebody on the street. Kurt, Kurt, I just want to know I, that I, I just uh, thank you for being here, and I just, uh, I just love you, and I just hope that you don't mind loaning me $50, and I just hope you'll understand. <laughs> If we talk to people, but there's nothing wrong. I've heard people, wonderful people, love the Lord, how they pray. They pray in King James English, and that's beautiful. But God speaks them all. And when we come boldly to the throne of our Father, I'm not saying just hop in there disrespectfully. Hey, this is a holy place. And until Jesus did what he did, there was a veil, literally and figuratively, that humans couldn't pass through unless they had met certain qualifications. But that veil was ripped, the throne room. There are no doors on the throne room. Come in boldly. Come in on purpose. Come in passionately. In fact, uh, my little side note here is without hesitation and with passionate purpose, to come boldly to the throne. Don't just come because you have a question or come to hide behind him and say, here, I'm, this is my father, devil. And I'm gonna, now you deal with him. I'd like that. But you come boldly to the throne to obtain two things in this passage. To obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. There is no need that's exempt or beneath God's willingness to liberally meet that need. And when we come boldly to his throne, Father, some people say Abba, some people say Papa, some people say, Oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, it's all good. But don't come in there like you don't belong because you don't just belong at the throne. You belong on his lap. He's in your heart. Come. The Bible says it over and over. Come. All of you who are labor heavy laden, come. Come boldly. Come liberally. I'll give you liberally if whatever it is your need is. You'll definitely get mercy and you'll definitely get grace when you come boldly to the throne because he's the fixer. He's the forgiver. Okay, needs met. I jumped a little ahead to my next one here. Philippians 4.19, and this is the amplified version. My God will liberally supply, fill until full, your every need according to his riches in glory, according to the deposit slips in heaven. I don't just mean money either. But he will meet your need according to his full resources. How many resources, how much resources do you think Father God has? <laughs> Well, let's see. I, you, we can't even comprehend it. We can't even put it in English words to properly communicate it. It's almost so big that we can't even think about it. But you should, because every need we have, he's more than ready, willing, capable to meet that need. It might not be by the definition we think is always right. But there again, that's where we, if we keep hiding his word in our heart, what we might think is wrong, it'll clear up those definitions. And then when we have the need, based on the fact our heart is pursuing God, and he's not against needs that we have on this earth either. We just don't need to make them our idols and our purpose. It's not wrong to have money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of it. There are people that like it really well. They said, money can't buy happiness. Well, it can rent it for quite a while. But you know what? That's still temporary. And you can't put your hope in it. You can be thankful when those things come, but they'll go. But the real need we have is the mercy and the grace. And the needs that we have will be met by those things. If we've failed in some way, if we've committed a sin in some way, if we've done something, the mercy, the grace... Well, it's there to meet that need. It's there. It's there all the time. He doesn't have to reapply it every time. It's always there. Jesus doesn't have to die on a cross every time for every person who confesses the sin. One time for all, that was enough. And no matter what our need is. And you know, the scripture also says this in Proverbs. Uh, if you fall a thousand times, just get up. Just get up. If you fail, if you fall, just get up. It's the getting up where the victory is. You know why? Because when sins are confessed, they're forgiven, and with God, they're in the sea of forgetfulness. We still keep record here for whatever reason. There's a, there's a good reason for it. There's also a, things bad happen because sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. 
But you see, the need we have there is to be forgiven, and he'll meet that need and every other need. And we need to be thankful for the fact that he will meet every need. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. The letter K, we need to be thankful for kindness. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as Christ in God forgave you. Kind and compassionate. I love, 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 love when I read the word that God's a straight talker, but he never just says one thing to define what he's done for us. He never says just one word to define. He's able to give exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I'm thankful for that. God has not put us out here in a wicked world and left us to fend for ourselves. He's given us the ability to be kind to people. And you know, to be kind to people, you have to do that on purpose. Some people may have it in their personality to be kind, but it's kindness when you do it on purpose. I know that because kindness is compassion. And that comes out of the heart, out of the middle of us. And that's the thing we need to be thankful for. Uh, uh, our needs can be met. We have kindness. We have the ability to boldly approach the throne. Those are good things to be thankful for. They're real. They're very real. And if you keep that little paper, you can refer to it whenever things get a little rough. And you can say, let's see if I can plug this in. It helps my day here. The F letter, faithful. <clears throat> I have two scriptures here. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Another layer, and just. And will forgive our sins. And purify us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> Remember in Scripture that Jesus told someone, if, they, if, if someone asks for your shirt, give them your coat too? Give them your coat too? That's, that, that's how God abundantly blesses us. The, the word faithful here, faithful and just, listen to this. Justice, the word justice means justice. Justice under grace is forgiveness. Justice under the law is punishment. We see it today when someone breaks the law. We want justice. Under the law, there's punishment. It's a punitive thing. But in the spirit world, sometimes we, we're, if we're guilty of anything, we're guilty of putting human thoughts in human ways of doing things. We attribute that to God, and it's, nothing could be further from the truth. We do that so we can kind of uh, maybe have some way that we can sort of try to understand it. But we really can't, folks. We really can't. Justice... If, read how the scripture says, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. Justice for someone who's born again, when they fall short, if they commit a sin, if they come, justice, there's punishment that still has to happen there, but it already happened on that cross. Justice after Jesus' death for you, if you're repentant of your sin, justice is to give you mercy. That's a lot to chew on. I'm still chewing on it. Because we always think of justice as the hammer of punishment. But the thing's backwards in the world of the spirit. What was dead is now alive. What was hate is now love. It's a wonderful thing. That's something good to chew on. Uh, after Christ, justice is forgiveness. That's the just thing for God to do. Because it's justice for Jesus, see. He didn't die in vain. Is that sinking in a little bit? It's a good thing to have hope, but it's a good reason to, to be thankful for him being faithful. He, he always remains faithful. Another scripture, 2 Timothy, if we are faithless, he still remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And believers, we have faith, and sometimes we run into situations where we get overwhelmed. We may not know what to do, what to think who to be with. We pray and we do the things that we need to do to go through it. He's going to always be there. You, can, you know he will always be there. He'll always be there. He said, I will never leave you. Is he ever going to leave us? No, I will never leave you and another or forsake you. I will never leave you. Well, Kurt, what happens if I 
Let's say somebody commits a sin or they do something wrong. What happens there? Does it, if, if he's in us, wouldn't God leave? Because, well, he said he would never leave us. That's why you feel bad about it, because it's conviction. <laughs> but the justice is not that he's convicting you for your sin, because it's so wrong. You already know that. The justice is he's saying, repent and come home, son. Come boldly to me. Come back. Come back. Jesus made that possible. And he's faithful to always be that way. To always be that way. Faithful. The letter U, understanding. Proverbs 2, 2 through 5. This one's interesting. So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding... If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Understanding. With all that getting, the Bible says, to get understanding. And yet, I grew up in a culture where uh, we can never know. We, we, We were raised in some situations to believe true words that were in the Bible, but only half of the truth. We used to sing a little song in Sunday school, eyes not seen, ears not heard, what's recorded in God's Word. That's not right because we have the Word that is recorded. <laughs> and it tells us. You know, when it talks about the last days in Scripture, it says that in, in that day things will happen, whatever, and the day the Lord will come as a thief in the night and earthquakes in diverse places and so forth. But then people say, oh, we can't know it. But if you read the next verse, it says, but you, brethren, that day will not overtake you as a thief. (laughs) Because you have ears to hear and eyes to see and be ready. See, so if we go that extra step, then we can gain full understanding of what the Scriptures is. Don't believe anything about the the Bible or God or anything because I said it or just because Tim said it or uh, any person or just because it's published in a book or because it's on the internet, because it's got to be true if it's on the internet. Nope. There's one truth. You don't have your truth, and I have mine. There's one truth. His name is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man or woman, no person, can come to the Father except by me. That's your truth. And we need to understand that. And I'm thankful, and we need to be thankful, that we can understand it. Don't sell yourself short when you look at that thick Bible and you read all these centuries of people put the little numbers and the letters and the, the, uh, all the other theological books that are written, and you go to the back to try to find a word, and there's a concordance, and you say, oh, I can't understand any of this, especially when I read all those things in the Old Testament. Don't be afraid of that. Make a decision, Lord, I want to understand. And you know, the first thing you do to get understanding is you got to listen. You got to hear first. That's my weakness. I got to tell you, just to listen more than talk. I'll just be quiet and listen for a while. He says, So incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Understanding only comes when we first listen to wisdom. We listen to wisdom. When we make a decision to read the scripture and hide it in our heart, then the direction from those spiritual vocabulary words is what I'll call it. The direction the Holy Spirit gives us brings understanding. To know that truth that we need to know, the only truth it is, is when we read that word. You know why? Because Jesus, the Bible says that he is the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word became flesh and lived among us. So he's our truth. We need to open our mind up to try to understand as much as possible. And there are some people who say, well, we're not supposed to understand everything. Well, I'll grant it. There's things I absolutely don't understand. But I'm not going to let that rule out the fact, well, it must just be a mess that we can never live up to. So I'm just going to, I don't understand it. But the Bible says we can have understanding. We have to embrace that, believe it, and pursue it. No matter how little bit of understanding we gain, you might just find some that will make things a lot better for you that you weren't expecting. 
And we have a little bit of time here, back to number one, to gain that understanding here. So I'm thankful that he's made it possible for us to understand God. And it says that, that we will understand the fear of the Lord and we will find the knowledge of God. It doesn't mean that we'll know everything God knows. That's not what that's saying. It's saying we'll find more about the knowledge of God. We'll begin to understand more about him. And when we seek wisdom, when we seek understanding, we find that. And the last letter, I'm going to make it all the way through. <clears throat> Love. John 3, 16. For God, boy, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes on him shall not perish. That word shall, I like to do word studies and stuff like that. So whoever believes in him will not, incapable of perishing, but have everlasting life. Not just leave you not dead. <laughs> when you die, you don't just go black and nothing's happening, but have everlasting life. In fact, and you know, everlasting life doesn't start when you leave your body. It starts when you're born again. You're alive. The body's going to do what it does. There's reasons for that. I'm not, it's a whole different study. But if you embrace Jesus, embrace the truth that the God who created all this universe, and I do things, crazy stuff. Like I, I watch some videos about uh, astrophysicists. They talk about how big the universe is. They don't know, but this banged and that banged and this planet and there's galaxies and light years and millions and thousands of light years away, there's got to be other life out there. Well, if there is, it's created by the God we know. The Bible said so. He created the heavens and the earth. And it doesn't say anywhere in Scripture, granted, this is a limited revelation, but we know it to be true because it's based on love and sacrifice. If the universe is as big and vast as it is, don't let that blow your mind. He created man in his image, his image. That's why we're here. And he loves us. Be thankful that he loves us. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I'm going to close. When we worship God, when we sing and we lift hands, or maybe our, our way of doing it is to stand silent and just enjoy the presence, or we wave a flag. Maybe we get happy and sing and clap and do all the other stuff. I grew up in the South, and I ain't going to tell you some of the stuff they do. But I'm not judging them because it was genuine. But he, he, as excited as we are sometimes to love him or whatever, he's way beyond that about us. Way beyond it. We use the word worship when we talk about God. And don't misunderstand this. God doesn't worship us. I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form. But he loves us more wildly, more reverently, more solemnly, more intimately, more passionately than we can ever know. The Bible says that he sings for joy. He dances for joy. We, we, we just put that in our mind because we can't put that kind of a picture in our brain. But he's so genuinely excited for us. He loved our lives more than his own. This is the God that created everything, and he put himself in a place through his son to die for people that still don't love him and still don't want to serve him, still don't understand. But we do understand here, folks, and maybe folks who might catch this on YouTube. We need to be thankful for God's love, and it's eternal. You know what the Bible says? Love never fails. When does love ever fail? Never, never, ever, ever, never, never fails. Nothing ever, never, ever, no. But what about, nope, <laughs> never. Love never fails. God is love. Whosoever believes in him and uh, confesses with their mouth, believes in their heart, confesses his mouth, will be saved. And he'll cast your sins. I'm saying it again, we're saying it every time. As far as east is from the west, cast them into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. But God, remember three years ago when I, shh, what are you talking about? Well, Kurt, he's God, he will remember it. He, did, he said he wouldn't. Oh, I'm grateful for faithfulness. I'm grateful, I'm grateful. 
Because if he doesn't remember it, it's, it's gone, folks. It would be well for us to forget it too. Someday. Someday. I'm done. I got them all. I got all eight of them in. <laughs> uh, feel, feel free to keep that right now. It's, it's just a good tool the Lord gave to me, and I haven't really done that type of thing before, but I hope it's a blessing to you. Um, I'm going to have everybody stand, if you would, please. And I'm going to, um, I want to enlist your help for me, if you would. I'm, um, I'm watching, and, and we, are, we are maybe all to some degree, but I'm watching uh, my body do some things I'm not very happy with, I, I'm <laughs> to be more specific. Um, I'm watching my my joints and my fingers, uh, they swell, they go crooked. They're, get, they're getting, and there's no real reason, nobody knows why that's happening just yet. Um, I'm not letting it stop me. I'm not, I have no fear of it. I'm doing what you have to do to, to address it. But the thing I haven't done is ask uh, the church's behalf to pray for me, and to pray with me, and to agree with me. Uh, I believe that by his stripes we are healed. Am I against doctors? No. All of it's gifts of healing. All of it comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. It's all good. It's all good. But uh, uh, well, it could be a twofold, a threefold cord. It's not easily broken. So I'd like for Mark, if you could come, and anybody would like to come and pray for me today. And then after, we, after the prayer, then uh, if anyone else has, uh, maybe you have a letter <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll take two or three people. If you have another letter you want to mention here uh, to share a little bit of testimony, we might do that. But if you'd pray, Mark, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Anybody that wants to come up and just lay hands on Kurt, that would be wonderful. Come on. Come on up here. That's the spirit. Thank you, brother. Dear Heavenly Father, Kurt has a faith in you and a belief in you, second to none. How many times did Jesus say, your faith has healed you? How many times did he say, because you believed, you are healed? We call your healing presence down on Kurt right now, whatever it is that's going on with his hands and his fingers. And we declare that that malady would be removed from him Thank now you. by your Thank power and your grace and your love and your healing. By Jesus' stripes, we are all healed. We command this healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We believe for this healing in Jesus' name, and we thank you for this healing in Jesus' name, and we will be looking forward to and thankful for the testimony that's about to come out yep. for this healing. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Everybody, just kind of bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we approaching Thanksgiving, and of course, we get together with family and loved ones, and we make turkey or ham or whatever the, the tradition is at the particular household, and we bring family together, and sometimes we go around the room and say what we're thankful for, and um, ultimately it comes down to we're thankful for Jesus, and we're thankful for the amazing gift that, that He brings us, the salvation, the hope that he brings us because of his ultimate sacrifice and his covenant with you to bring us to heaven with him. So this, this week, let's all remember that. Help us all to be mindful of that in everything that we do. And when we are tempted and we're angered or we're frustrated or things of, of that nature come up and they, they tend to lead us away from you, help us to remember what we're doing this week, giving thanks to you for every blessing and every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week.